Hi, my name is Mike Bachman. I'm a United Methodist pastor serving a new church start here in the city of Dallas called Union. And I've been invited by the Bayina Institute to come in and do an interview with uh, Imam Omar Suleiman today. We've got an uh, audience with us to, to be a part of um, our conversation. I'm really excited to have the opportunity to ask some questions uh, of the Imam, uh, a lot of questions that I believe that uh, Americans wonder about Islam. And I've had this realization over time that a lot of what I've been hearing about Islam recently are things that I've heard primarily from politicians and pundits and not actually from Muslims themselves. And I think that um, we need to have opportunities for dialogue and conversation uh, with Muslims uh, about their own faith uh, before we come to any sort of conclusion or, or, or beliefs as individuals, as a society and beyond. Uh, and so I'm really eager for this conversation to have the opportunity uh, to hear directly from a man who is well studied, is well respected, uh, and, and is a leader in uh, Islam here in uh, Dallas area and then also in the United States as a whole. So I'm really excited to get to spend some time with you uh, today. Appreciate it. Thank yeah, you for coming. Absolutely. Looking forward to it. Um, so uh, I'm curious, uh, we might as well just, just start, off, uh, start off well off the bat. Um, you know, it isn't that like Muslims just arrived in America. Sure. <laughs> um, Muslims have been in this country for a while. Like and, five years, right? Yeah, about five years or so, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so Muslims have been in this country for, for, for a long time, to, to varying degrees, of course. And, and I'm not that old in the grand scheme of things. I'm 37. Um, but I've certainly noticed over the past several years that um, there's been more and more uh, conversation around Muslims in America. There's been more anti-Muslim rhetoric uh, in recent times than I remember from the past. And I'm curious if, if you have a sense of, of why, why this has developed um, over the past you know, decade or maybe two. Sure. Well, Islam is, is actually very old. It's as old as the country is. So yeah. there were Muslims here when, when Christopher Columbus arrived uh, amongst the, the, the native population that were here. Uh, obviously, a great population of the, of the slaves that were brought to the United States, estimates up to 35-40% of the slaves came from Muslim countries. They were Muslim as well. Mm. Um, you know, the first country to actually recognize the United States was a Muslim country, was Morocco. Huh. And, you know, we find Thomas Jefferson owning a Qur'an, a copy of the Qur'an. Uh, Congressman Keith Ellison swore in on it as well as Andre Carson. Uh, and it's become sort of a thing. but. Uh, it's, we've been around for quite a while in this country. And so, um, you know, Islam is, is quite old in this country. The fascination with Muslims uh, didn't really start until after World War II. So historically speaking, after World War II, that's when America started with its fascination of Islam and, and, and Muslims abroad, particularly the Muslim world, trying to understand the Muslim world. Obviously, then you have the Israel-Palestine issue arises in, in sure. the 40s. And then you have, after that, as time goes on, you have the Iranian Revolution. Um, you have the Gulf Wars, right? So what we see is that around the 1990s, academically speaking, suddenly you have all of these Center for Middle Eastern Studies and Islamic Studies and Arabic culture and so on and so forth uh, popping up on the academic level all around the country. Then 9-11 happened. And after 9-11, yeah. it's like, you know, who are these people? What happened? Everyone wanted to know about Islam. Yeah. So actually, you would go to many public libraries and you'd find that there would be no copies of the Quran. They'd all be checked out. So mm -hmm. people wanted to read about Islam. Um, and this wasn't just the American population. This wasn't just the civilian population. Even uh, intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies, everyone was suddenly trying to get really informed about Islam. Yeah. Now the problem is, is that um, you had all of these um, you know, hate mongers and hate groups masquerading as experts that started mm -hmm. all of these independent intelligence agencies and security agencies and started offering training to, you know, to different law enforcement agencies across the country and so on and so forth. Again, uh, many of them claiming to be former Muslims and former terrorists uh, turned out to be complete scams, but we paid for that with our tax dollars. <laughs> and mm -hmm. These were hate groups that eventually were identified by the Southern uh, Poverty Law Center as hate groups, but they just spread throughout the country and they were informing some of the most important people in our country. Yeah. So for example, Frank Gaffney, who's, who's, who's a fear monger, uh, you know, he has a Center for Security Policy, which all the names tend to be around Center for Security Policy or something of that sort. And he's in the ear of every Republican candidate out there. You know, Rubio's attended his forums as well as, uh, as, well as Ted Cruz and so on and so forth. And, you know, he appears to be an expert, yeah. but these are hate mongers and hate groups that have masqueraded as experts. They don't have credentials. 
um, nor do they have any traction in the Muslim community. And so that's sort of a phenomenon in the West right now that we've had in the United States and even in the United Kingdom, yeah. where you have these, you know, these, these so-called counter-terrorism experts that have arose out of nowhere and sort of taking advantage of the fascination. And so you believe that it's largely those organizations that have led to a lot of the um, negative conversation and negative dialogue that we seem to see uh, in the United States, especially in the political arena, or are they just a contributing factor? Um, they are contributing, so it's media as well, right? Hollywood, yeah. the old Hollywood movies, and even till now, the portrayal of Muslims. Right. Number one is that they're all Arab, which <laughs> Um, Arab, Arabs make up only about 15% of Muslims uh, mm -hmm. globally, so Muslim and Arab are not synonymous. There are a lot of yeah. Arab Christians as well. Number two, it's always backwards and people screaming Allahu Akbar, and you've got to worry about you've got to worry about the Muslim next door. You know, he's going to turn out to be an evil operative that works for someone overseas. So you know, Homeland right. and all these types of shows that have come out. So it's Hollywood, it's you know, mainstream media. What, what's supposed to be mainstream media also yeah. contributing as well. So it's. Uh, the climate is not good because people are not hearing, as you started off, from educated experts or experts on Islam or Muslims themselves even. They're hearing from uh, various interest groups, yeah. um, either directly or through you know, these various manifestations that we've mentioned. Well, it makes sense. I mean, fear is something that sells. Yeah. Um, you know, we oftentimes say sex sells in Hollywood or other, other places, but really... Um, you know, especially in the political arena, fear absolutely fear can be a big driving motivation. And so, sure. how is it that you know the average American can sift through these different voices? If, if there is this group that's you know masquerading as experts, or you know how do we how do we work our way through understanding? Yeah, this is a good source. This isn't because it's it's hard. And I think we're in American society realizing that that who's speaking to us almost matters as much as what they're saying. Sure, sure. And, and so and how, how do we sift through that? Well, by approaching mainstream Muslims, going to your local mosque, uh, reaching out to local organizations, trying to understand mainstream Muslims, there's often a, a uh, you know, this question or this, that's posed, well, why aren't Muslims out there? But it's not, you know, the media will cover who the media wants to cover. Right. And anyone that's involved, you know, on a local scene in whatever locality they are, will know that the Muslim community is actually quite, um, you know, out uh, up front in terms of condemning terrorism and so on and so forth, but it's more than that. It's actually going and experiencing uh, your local mainstream Muslim population. So going to the local mosques, and it might not be the most pleasant experience because mosques are as diverse as churches are in America, if not more yeah. diverse, right? Yeah. And when you go to any church, you're going to get a different feel for each church, right? Absolutely. So, but still, reach out to the local Muslim population. And what I what I tell people all the time is that we love being asked about our religion. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's actually refreshing. It's a nice departure from the typical uh, go back home and stuff like that that we usually hear at Walmart or in a parking lot of a grocery store. Right. <laughs> when someone asks, you know, stops and very nicely says, "Can I ask you a question? You know, about about your hijab. You know, th that what you're yeah. wearing. You know, the scarf that women wear." Can I ask you something about your religion? Is it okay uh, if I just ask you something politely? That actually is extremely refreshing yeah. uh, for us. So just ask a Muslim yeah. about Islam, right? That's, it's, 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 it sounds simple, but it's unfortunately, you know, the intimidation and the fear factor has gotten so much that we don't talk to each other anymore. Yeah, yeah.